thank you very much for the, the invite to talk. Um, I think in Sam's talk, he mentioned it was was late in the UK. It's now significantly later in the UK. Uh, so this talk is going to be quite light. I will tell you a bit today about some types of functor calculus and how you can kind of move between these versions. So I guess the natural starting point is to talk about what a calculus actually is. And this will be quite general, but I'll tell you kind of the, the cases that I'm interested in as we go. So we'll go back to our favorite thing from undergrad, Taylor's theorem, and we'll start off with some functions, say, on the real line. And you might ask what we can do with this. And well, one thing we know is that we can build it out of polynomial functions that are called uh, Taylor polynomials. Hey, Niall, I just wanted to check really quick. Is your screen um, perhaps cut off a little bit? We see functor calculi and. Is that better? That's better. Yes. Thank you. OK. Uh, so to the polynomials that are written like this. Um, and the natural thing to do is just categorify all of these things, right? So you want to replace a function, you just make it a functor. And we just take some functors from some category C into some other category M. And we replace these Tiller polynomials with essentially just polynomial approximations that I will tell you how to construct in a bit. And we call those T and of F. And again, there's one for every N and they behave exactly how you would guess that they behave. So you know, something is n polynomial, then it's n plus one polynomial. The n plus first derivative of something n polynomial disappears, so on, so forth. So the benefit of Taylor's theorem is that these polynomials are in some way calculable. You know, you can just take the difference between the nth and the n minus one, or n minus first, and you get some formula involving the derivatives and a power of x. And the natural question is, well, what happens if we try and do something like this in the functor calculus world? And so difference here, so I'm going to say that my category M up here is some kind of model category. Don't know what model category is, just say base spaces every time I say model category. Uh, and what you want to do is to come to be fiber of the map from the n minus first approximation or from the nth approximation to the n minus first approximation. And well, you can ask, does this come with some nice description in terms of the derivatives? And we'll, we'll see that in a bit. So the benefit of this is that you can gather all these polynomial approximations together into a Taylor tar which you should just think of as the Taylor series. All right, and what we're really interested in is what are the differences between each successive polynomial approximation, and this whole thing sits under the, the functor you want to approximate. So we want to use information about these layers to tell us information about the polynomial bits to then get information about the original functor. So it's all very abstract and a bit nonsense. So what we care about particularly today are functors from the category of vector spaces over some field to base spaces. And in particular, only when F is the real numbers or complex numbers. All right, so when F is the real number, this is called orthogonal calculus. It was originally developed by Michael Weiss in the 90s. For uh, the complex case, it's called unitary calculus. It's been around for a while, but hasn't really been well written down until last year. So you might ask kind of an obvious question as to right, okay, you can do it, but why should anyone actually care about this? And so let's, I want to give you a couple of reasons as to why you should care.
So the first one uh, is for the, the homotopy theorists in the audience. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the stable homotopy groups of the sphere, which is just the homotopy groups of the suspension spectrum of the sphere. So if you know anything about homotopy groups of spheres, you know that these are basically impossible to calculate, but it's slightly easier to calculate than the actual homotopy groups of spheres. So there is a, a way to take, strangely enough, uh, information about the homotopy groups of spheres to tell you information about the stable homotopy groups. It's called the EHP spectral sequence, and it has E1 page given by unstable homotopy groups, and it converges to the stable homotopy groups of the zero sphere. Okay, you probably have to put in some kind of two locally condition here, but let's just gloss over that. But there is another way that uses a type of functor calculus. So in the 90s, Goodwillie developed a calculus which looks at functors from base spaces to base spaces. You can also put spectra in these places and it also works fine. In which case he showed that the homotopy fiber of the map between the nth approximation and the n minus first. Well, we call that dn, and it is actually given as an infinite loop space of some spectrum. And the spectrum has an action of the symmetric group. That's not overly important for our purposes. And this gives another spectral sequence called the Goodwillie spectral sequence with E1 page given by the homotopy groups of the spectrum, let's say at some space x, and it converges to, uh, let's change x to be a sphere, and let's change f to be the identity functor, because it's easier. So say we have the identity functor on a sphere, and it converges to the stable homotopy groups no, it doesn't converge to the homotopy groups of the sphere. So, is P a dummy variable here then? Oh, P should be a P. Yeah. Somewhere. Thanks. That looks slightly better. Okay, so the point is that this goodly spectral sequence takes stable information in the terms of the, the spectrum, this dn or this dp, and converges exactly to kind of the terms that are appearing in the EHP spectral sequence. So in work by Behrens, he basically said, okay, these spectral sequences inform each other. So if you know something about differentials in one, you know something about differentials in the other, and vice versa. So he did he used this to do a bunch of different calculations of um, stable homotopy groups, so 100 and something pages worth of calculations. So where do vector spaces come in? Well, that comes into work of Barnes and Eldred. We saw similarities between Goodwillie calculus and the orthogonal calculus. So they took a functor in the Goodwillie sense, so one between base spaces, and they assumed that this was nice. Then what they could show was that if you look at the Taylor Tower that we constructed, but this time in orthogonal calculus of the functor, but you can pre-compose it with this thing that I will call S, then that's the same as looking at the tar in Goodwillie calculus of F and precomposing that with S, where S is just the functor that sends a vector space to its one point compactification. 
So in essence, what Baron was actually doing when he was looking at the Goodwill spectral sequence on spheres was doing orthogonal calculus on these on these spheres. I will also say nice a bunch of times, and every time I say nice, it has a different meaning. So just take that with a pinch of salt. So I'll stop here if anyone has any questions. Okay, let's, let's give another reason as to why you should care. And this one comes in the form of uh, some geometry. And when I say geometry, I'm coming at geometry from a stable homotopy theorist point of view. So um, take the word geometry with a pinch of salt. There is a theorem from the 80s of Miller. And what Miller did was he looked at the space of linear isometries from CQ into CN. This is the Stiefel manifold of Q frames in CN. And he constructed a filtration on the space that was given, or the quotients of which were Tom spaces over Grassmannians. And what he wanted to do was compare this space to its quotient. So he took um, the, the quotient. of the filtration, took all of them. There are only a few of them, so it's not too bad. And I wanted to compare these two spaces. And what I was able to show is that this stiefel manifold splits after taking suspension vector, so stably splits. But there are other filtrations on spaces that look like this. So at around the same time, so approximately in the 1980s, uh, Mitchell and Richter uh, gave a filtration of I could spell on a very similar space. You take loops on something slightly more general. So you take two vector spaces, you look at linear isometries between one and one plus another. So then our isometries are always injective, so we can always do this. Um, so they give a filtration, and it was, in fact, Mahowald who made the following conjecture. So he said, well, this comes with a filtration, so something similar to the, the Mitchell or to the Miller result should happen in that. When you compare the space and the wedge of the quotient in the filtration, you should, well, there are infinitely many of them this time, but that's not too important. Again, this should stably split. And this remained quite unsolved for quite a while. So Mahul made this conjecture in the 1980s, 1990s. It was early 2000s when it was, was solved, and it was solved by this point of view of looking at the space of linear isometries as a functor. So the kind of point of view you want to take is that we can write linear isometries from some vector space into it plus something else as a functor, which just assigns the vector space to the, to the right space of linear isometries. And so applying loops to that still gives you a functor from vector spaces to spaces. And it was exactly this point of view that let Aron prove the conjecture of Mahold and actually just recover the Miller result as well. So we took a functor from vector spaces over the complex numbers to base spaces uh, with a, again, nice filtration. Let me call that. Hi. And he showed that you recover the functor from the quotients again after taking suspension spectra on both sides. And this exactly recovers the result of Miller and the conjecture of Mahold. So now we're going to move on from why you should care into how it works. 
and try and tell you a little bit about how these polynomial functors are constructed um, and then how we can compare polynomial things over R and polynomial things over C. Unless we have questions at this point. All right, so if you're familiar with um, good Willy calculus at all, you'll know that it relies a lot on cubical homotopy theory. So something similar happens here, right? We, good Willy calculus really looks at cubes and spaces and properties of these high, highly dimensional cubes and spaces and what the functors do to these, these cubes. So let's start off by looking at a generalization of cubical homotopy theory, but what we call uh, or n cubes. Let's go back to the very beginning. What is a square? Well, a square is four spaces and some maps connecting them. And what this translates to really is a functor from the power set of the set of two elements into base spaces. So here to underline is just the set one, two. So the top vertex corresponds to its value on the epi set, the value on the one element set containing one, value on the one element set containing two, and value on the whole thing. So that gives us a way to define what a cube is. If you put in three here and draw the picture, you'll get exactly what you think. So you can keep going and define an n cube to just be a functor From the power set of the set of n elements to base spaces. So the, the natural guess as to what an or n cube is, well we just go and take the set of n elements and replace it by the, the vector space or n. So we start off with the set of n elements and it gets transferred to the space vector space or n. So what happens to the power set? Well, you look at what I'm going to call P of 4n. So this is the post set of subspaces of 4n, but importantly, this has a, has a topology. So over on the, the, the cubicle side of things over here, there's no topology. Everything's just discrete. But over here, there is actually an awful lot of topology going along, and you need to really remember this topology at every step. So we can use this to define an ORN cube, which you know is exactly what you think. So an ORN cube is a functor from this post set of subspaces of ORN to base spaces. So this is hard to imagine. So let's Let's draw some. So let's start off with the easiest example, an OR cube. So the post set here, you have a point that will correspond to your value on the zero dimensional vector space, and a point that will correspond to the value on OR, and a line drawing them. So this is no different to what you would expect um, a one cube to be. But when you move to OR2 is when you see the real complication of the topology coming into play. So you still have the zero dimensional vector space and its value. You still have the value on the real line and then you're choosing an embedding of the real line into the plane. You have a value in order two, and you choose an embedding of the real line into the plane. And you have to then, in some ways, keep track of the fact there are infinitely many embeddings, right? So if you're choosing to embed the real line in, as say, the horizontal axis, then you have to keep track of all the rotations of the horizontal axis about the origin. So that's just a different embedding of the real line into the plane. So that gives you an S1's worth of points here. And you then have all possible 
lines connecting them. So if you know much topology in these things, this initial vertex is just the Grassmannian of zero dimensional subspaces of R2. This is the Grassmannian of one dimensional subspaces of R2, which is 4P1, which is S1. And here you have the Grassmannian of two dimensional subspaces of R2. And of course, I'm doing OR here, but put in C, and it works just as well. So, in general, this post set is what we call topological, which is more than just being a category enriched in spaces. It means it has a, it's a category that has a space of objects and a space of morphisms. So the space of objects is actually quite nice to write down. So it's exactly what it looks like in this picture here, where we have this disjoint union of Grassmannians. You just have all the Grassmannians below a certain degree. So you think all the Grassmannians for k less than n of k dimensional subspaces of Rn. And the, the morphism space is also not horrific to write down, but I'm not going to for the purposes of, of time. So what is the point? Well, if you've played around with cubes before and cubical homotopy theory, there's a bunch of algebra going on here, right? You can talk about cubes being homotopy Cartesian, homotopy co-Cartesian, you know, you can think of total fibers, total cofibers, so on and so forth. And the whole point is, well, they just came from the factory defining this thing as a functor. And we can do the exact same thing here. We can talk about homotopy Cartesian, homotopy co-Cartesian, total fibers, and so on. So as an example of one of the definitions, so a cube X or an Oren cube X is homotopy Cartesian. If the map from the cube at the initial vertex into the limit over the remaining vertices, so we get rid of the initial of the cube is an equivalence. So here all I'm doing is I'm taking the cube, and I'm getting rid of the initial vertex, so I'm puncturing the cube, pulling all the vertices left back to get this limit and asking the map from the initial vertex to this limit as an equivalence. And this is actually enough to define what a polynomial functor is. So if you've ever read Michael Weiss's original definition of this, it is the exact same definition. He just doesn't really say where it comes from. And this is one point of view of where it comes from. So we take a functor. We can go back to being general, because I don't want to draw pictures. So from vector spaces over f, e and f is or or c. Okay, and f is n polynomial, so it's meaning polynomial of degree less than or equal to n, but it's just a quicker way of writing it. If the map from f on some vector space v into the home degree limit over the non-zero vertices, the Rn plus one cube is an equivalence. So what we're saying is that this is the exact same as taking your functor, restricting it to an Rn plus one cube, such that when you take the functor, look at the restricted, and look at the initial vertex, you just have f of v, and you want this to be homotopy Cartesian. And this is for all v. Now this limit here is actually what we use to define then the polynomial approximations. So let me just call this tau n f of v. So if you're familiar with good calculus, this tau n is good release tn, and my tn are good release pn. I didn't come up with the confusion, but I'm just going to stick with it. 
So we can define the polynomial approximation, the nth polynomial approximation of a functor to just be at the stabilization of this, this tau n functor. So you take the limit of the co-limit over iterated applications of this tau n viewed as a functor. And this gives you the universal n polynomial thing. So, I mean, it's a bit of work to do it's even n polynomial, but it is. And if you have a map, write it from f to e, where this e is n polynomial, this will factor through the n polynomial approximation, but just up to homotopy. So are there any questions at this point? So what is the reason it does not suffice to take tau n once? It's not n polynomial. Okay. So you might be thinking, right, okay, we can do this, but these Rn cubes look pretty horrific to actually do anything with. Are there any calculations? So let me give you a calculation. When I say calculation, I'll write it. Don't do it. So there's a functor, which at v, you send to the stabilization of the real projective space, which v, which at this joint base point. This is, in fact, one polynomial. So to see this, you can play around with a bunch of different cubes uh, and figure it out. Or what you can actually do is see that f is the first approximation of the functor. So I'll write as this. which sends a vector space to the quotient of the infinite orthogonal group, what out the orthogonal group in that vector space. And you can calculate this directly from the Taylor tire, which I will try and tell you a bit now. So we saw before that we had this tire. We wanted to know what the, the, the error between the successive polynomial approximations was. So this has a similar format to how it appears in the Goodwillie calculus, so if you know what that is. Um, so this is originally due to Michael Weiss for uh, the case when f is or and myself when f is complex numbers. So we had these errors of our approximations that's some vector space v, what you get is you get an infinite loop space, again, of a spectrum. So this spectrum is given by, you take the derivatives, which I haven't told you about, but they exist. And you can make this into a spectrum with an action of on or un. You suspend it a bunch of times, depending on your vector space and the approximation you're looking at. This smash product has a bunch, uh, or has a UN action, or an ON action, so you mod out by the action, and take the infinite loop space of the resulting spectrum. Where, if I explain what some of these things are, so this theta FN is just a spectrum with an action of odd N, and odd N is just the automorphisms of FN, so it's, either on or un and nv is just n multiples of v. So we get exactly what we would expect if you know good way calculus, you get a you get a version of the same result. Any questions? If not, we can then move on to how we can compare these two. So let's take a, take a bit of a pause on the calculus for a minute.
Um, okay, and let's look at some topological K theory. So if someone asks you to give them topological K theory, you're probably going to tell them about KU, right, which is the complex version. But there is, of course, a real version, just replacing where you put complex vector bundles with real vector bundles. And there are maps that go between them. And on the level of spectra, these are even, these are even rig maps. So there's a complexification map, which I'll call C. So you just, on the vector bundle level, you just tensor over OR with C. And there's a map in the opposite direction, which I'll call OR. And this is what's called realification or decomplexification. And all you do is forget the complex structure. So OR of some CK is just OR 2K to the underlying set and only allow multiplication by the real numbers. So KO was built from real vector spaces. So there's kind of a, an ad hoc analogy between it and the orthogonal version of the calculus. And the same thing we said then on the unitary side. So KU built from complex vector spaces, so was unitary calculus. And there's an ad hoc relationship here, kind of an analogy. And the question is, is there something sitting between these two versions of calculus that make this diagram of analogies commute? I mean, is there some version of this realification complexification relationship happening on the level of calculus? And is it good for anything? So the answer actually turns out to be yes, then it's pretty much exactly what you would think it would be. So if you go to the level of vector spaces, so vector spaces over OR and vector spaces over C, this complexification and realification form an adjoint pair. So we can use these to build or to move a functor from taking values in vector spaces over OR to taking values in uh, vector spaces over C. So if we start, say, with the functor that starts off in vector spaces over OR. I want to move it to a function that starts off in vector spaces over C. Well, there's kind of only one thing you can do. And now let's just add in the map from vector spaces over C to vector spaces over OR, this realification map. And then you just take the composite, which is pre composition by OR. Of course, the same thing then works if we start off with the other type of functor and take the other uh, comparison. So we start off with a functor E between vector spaces over C and spaces. And we just add on to the start this complexification functor and take the composite. So the natural question is, Okay, is it good for anything? Does it actually preserve any of the things you would want it to preserve? So I mean, the existence of these is essentially trivial, but I mean, if it doesn't send the n polynomial approximations to the n polynomial approximations, is it good for anything? The answer is no, but luckily in our case, it does actually do what you'd want it to do. So how we're gonna do this is we're gonna work backwards along the tire. We're going to start off with the, the errors and work backwards to gain information about the polynomial functors and then the, the entire picture. So the layers of the tar are actually a special case of a more general type of functor. So a functor is what we call n homogeneous if it is both n polynomial And it's n minus first approximation bashes. So the layer is an example. In fact, the theorem we had before was classified the layers of these infinite loop spaces of spectra work for any homogeneous functor, not just the layers. So the starting point is well, what do the comparisons do on 
these homogeneous things. So you should think of these as things that just have an n polynomial part, but no, no lower polynomial parts floating about. So what happens on the homogeneous parts is the following. So we start off with something uh, n homogeneous uh, in orthogonal calculus. So from now on, f is always going to live in orthogonal calculus and e will always live in unitary calculus. So you don't have to keep writing down them as functors. So start off with something n homogeneous. And after this reification, we get something again that is n homogeneous. And in fact, what might look weird to initially, you start off with something n homogeneous in unitary calculus, complexify, you get something that is actually 2n homogeneous. So the 2n seems a bit weird to start off with. That's actually what you should expect. So if you realify a complex vector space, you double the dimension. If you complexify a complex vector space or a real vector space, it, it um, preserves dimension. But because you're pre-composing with both of these things, you should expect the direction to swap. So pre-complexifying with double dimension and pre-realifying with maintained dimension. But what's annoying is that this doesn't actually tell us anything about the layers. So unfortunately for any f um, and any e, there's no clear connection between the layers. But we can look at a special um, type of functor for which it works. So um, let's do it in the, the f case. So if f is a different version of the word nice, then taking layers of f and then moving it in the calculus, or looking at the errors of f moved from orthogonal calculus into unitary calculus is the same thing. There's, there's no difference. And the same works then if we take something in unitary calculus and apply this pre-composition with complexification under this condition that f is nice. So this nice condition, I can spell out a bit what this means. And this just means that the map from f at v into its polynomial approximation is, I hope I get this right, if the dimension of the vector space plus the dimension of the polynomial thing plus one, you know, I just shift it by a constant connected. And this is for, for all n. So, okay, so these polynomial approximation things are notoriously hard to calculate. So do we actually know any functors for which this works? So actually, if you start writing down the list of things you would want this to work for, it turns out to work for them all. So examples of nice functors. So we have this sphere functor from before, which maps a vector space to its one point compactification. You can look at the functor BO, which maps a real vector space to the classifying space of its orthogonal group. You can look at the unitary version. The complex vector space goes to classifying space of its unitary group. And you can look at things like representable functors, so just sends a vector space to the linear isometries from some fixed vector space to you. All of these are all of these are nice. And the even better thing about these nice functors is that their tires converge to the original input functor. So just by Coming up with this definition of nice, we have a bunch of, of, of new calculations in this. So then we can just extend this along to the polynomial parts just by using the fact that this dn is the homotopy fiber between the map between the nth approximation and the n minus first approximation. So I'll just give the, the, the good version. So if f is 
nice. Then it doesn't matter if you send f into the unitary calculus and then polynomial approximate or polynomial approximate and then send the approximation into unitary calculus. And then in the case when you're looking at something in unitary calculus, you just get a 2n appearing in the right place. So this is moderately annoying, right? You have this, this condition in which works for the functors you want it to work for, but somehow it doesn't seem to work for them all. And in particular, I should say that this all implies that when f is nice, it doesn't matter when you look at the Taylor tire of f as a functor in unitary calculus or the Taylor tar of f in orthogonal calculus and then pre-compose with this vilification functor. Hey, Niall. Yeah. Uh, I think your screen might be getting cut off again a little bit. Can we see it now? Well, I see, so like, um, I see like if f There's is nice, then there. yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Is it still there? Yeah. All right, so we have this nice thing and we want to try and fix it in some way. So it brings me on to kind of my last point on how we can fix this. So um, I should say at this point, things become joint work, um, joint work with uh, Gregorone from Stockholm. And so to fix this, what we do is we introduce a new meaning of nice, uh, but I'll give it its actual words. So functor f is analytic if when you restrict f to an Orian cube, with kind of the same condition we had before on the initial vertex of the restricted cube. So the initial vertex should just be f at some vector space. You want this to be another level of Cartesian, but this time it's kind of a weird looking formula involving a shift of the dimension space of the dimension of the vector space, the dimension of the cube, and another shift. Okay, with these, R and C is just constants. It can be anything. And so the point is, that these analytic functors are essentially the building blocks for any functor in say orthogonal calculus. So we could replace R with C again and would work, but so what I mean by this is that the building blocks is that if you want to construct a, a cellular approximation to these functors in the projective model structure, so now I'm saying words that if you don't understand, just ignore me. So if you want to construct a cellular approximation of this functor in the projective model structure, well, the, the cells that you use in this projective model structure are all analytic. You can show that they preserve different unions and push outs and so forth so that the approximation will be, uh, a functor will be approximated by a, a sequence of analytic functors. So in the, this actually means is that any F can be written as a filtered homotopy co-limit of some alpha alphas with each alpha alpha analytic. And what is this good for? Well, in particular, uh, analytic implies the nice from before. So if you have an analytic functor, um, pre-composing this realification functor preserves the polynomial approximations. 
So you can get that uh, for any f, doesn't matter if you polynomially approximate in unitary calculus or polynomially approximate in orthogonal and then shift the calculus. So in particular, um, we get the statement for the tires. We get an equivalence between the tire in unitary calculus and the tire in orthogonal calculus then shifted to unitary calculus. So are there any questions at this point? Does weak equivalence always mean point-wise weak equivalence? Yes. Okay. So I have five minutes, so I will say one more thing in these five minutes. Uh, and that takes me back to topological K theory. So we had KO and KU, but they have a kind of bigger cousin that tells you all you need to know about KO and KU. So if we remember our diagram from before, we had KO complexified, we got KU, forgot the structure, we got KO. Kind of sitting above both of these is what's denoted KO and it's what's called K theory with reality. And um, so this is uh, constructed by Atia, and what it is, it's the unitary or the complex K theory, but you take into account that complex vector spaces have an action uh, of C2 by just complex conjugation. And the thing was that KR and taking C2 fixed points completely recovers KO, and forgetting the C2 action completely recovers. KU. So what you can ask is, does there exist a calculus version of KO or of KR, sorry? And the fact is that there does. So you can think about what's called calculus with reality. As construction is kind of the obvious thing, you take the unitary calculus and put a C2 action on all the vector spaces everywhere you can think of putting it. And so this means that instead of looking at functors from that land in spaces, we have to look at functors that land in spaces with an action of C2. So it's functors from vector spaces over C, but remembering that they have complex conjugation to C2 spaces. And this whole construction works just as you would think it would work. So we can even classify the layers in this in this case. So in this calculus from the reality, we get essentially the same classification. as we had for unitary calculus, but this spectrum that we build from the derivatives is actually now a spectrum with an action of the semi-direct product of un c2. So here you let c2 act on un by complex conjugation of matrices. And kind of the big picture on this whole calculus story is that if you start off with functor from vector spaces over C with this C2 action to C2 spaces. You can get a functor in orthogonal calculus. Well, by the way you would think, you add on a, a vector spaces over R at the start and complexify to get vector spaces over C2 and this has this, or over C and this has this C2 action. And then to get it to, from C2 spaces to spaces, you take homotopy C2 fixed points, and then you just take this functor. And you can do then the, the kind of other obvious thing, uh, starting with the same functor, well, you can just kind of ignore the C2 action on the vector space variable and forget 
the C2 action that we end up with and take this functor. And the point in the final minute is that this, so meaning these things, let me zoom out, completely recover the orthogonal and unitary calculus. All right, and I'll stop there. All right, thank you, Niall. <laughs> uh, so it's it is four o'clock, but um, let's maybe take a minute or two for questions, uh, real quick. So does anyone have any questions? Can you clarify what what you precisely mean by completely recover these two calculi? Uh, so the unitary version is the easiest one. So. Uh, you take a functor um, in this calculus with reality, um, and that is equivalent to taking a functor in unitary calculus. You get an equivalence of categories pretty much. So you have to forget some action, but when you forget the action, there's an equivalence of categories, and one functor, and the functor is polynomial in the calculus with reality, if and only if it's polynomial in the unitary calculus after you forget the action. And then you get the same kind of statements for the orthogonal version. Okay, thanks. So, so the, the categories are really equivalent as categories or only up to a multiple or something? Uh, so you, there's, a, there's a subtle change of universe thing that has to happen, and that gives you an equivalence of categories. Okay.